First of all, I would like to thank you and Gülçin for the invitation here. It is a privilege and an honor to be in Bodrum at the PFS conference. And I hope to tell you something interesting this afternoon. Uh, my um, talk to, to this afternoon comes from a suggestion by Professor Hoppe last year. Um, if you didn't uh, uh, hear his presentation last year, I urge you to do so. Um, it was a presentation about uh, Swiss um, political scientist, jurist, uh, Karl Ludwig von Haller. He lived from 1768 to 1854, and his main work um, is in, has the title Restoration of the Political Science. And um, his, his main enemies were the, uh, the, 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 the theorists of the social contract. So his aim is to destroy the idea that the power com comes somehow magically from the people and there is a sort, that there is a sort of delegation of powers from the people to the governments, which is still the foundation of most of our modern states. Uh, if you, if you, uh, the social contract is always mentioned, especially during the last years, in a negative sense, the social contract has been broken. But anyway, this is something which we learn from school. There is a social contract, there is a sort of covenant at the, at the uh, basis of all societies. Um, Ludwig von Haller, uh, with his ideas, we, I will expand on, the, on his ideas later during, during my, my talk, uh, wasn't very liked as a, as, a, as a thinker. I may mention two uh, very negative remarks on Karl Ludwig von Haller. One by, his, um, by Hegel, who wrote something very interesting. Of course, he said Karl Ludwig von Haller is, is, uh, is wrong and, and his idea of the state is completely different. And uh, he says which, something which is very interesting. He said, if the state is confused with a protection agency for property and personal freedom, then membership is just an optional matter. Hegel wrote this and he said this is why Karl Ludwig von Haller is completely wrong. But I think this is a very interesting remark from a, from a philosopher like Hegel, if you're familiar with his idea of the state as the, the, the highest duty of any individual to being a member of the state. Uh, another very negative remark about Karl Ludwig von Haller came from Hannah Arendt in The Origins of Totalitarism. She said, uh, basically, my fear is without ever reading Haller, she said he is just an advocate for the ancien regime. He was one, uh, one of the, of the uh, theorists who tried to, um, to find a basis for the restoration. Uh, in fact, uh, his main opus, uh, the first volume was pu published in 1816 and he wrote the, the uh, following five volumes, it, it's, uh, it's a big work, uh, until 1834. Um, in fact, Haller doesn't uh, say much about Roman law, this is not the main topic of his research, his, the main topic of his research are modern states, are the kingdoms, are the princes, are the republics and democracies. And this is what he analyzes and he tries to find, and in fact, in my opinion, he does find uh, a new theory to explain why states exist and what they do, uh, a theory which is, of course, at odds with the, with the theory of social contract. So Roman law is not his topic and he just makes a few passing remarks on Roman law. A few passing remarks which are, however, highly intelligent and very interesting. In a 10 pa pages more or less, he uh, gives a short and brief anal analysis of Roman law and especially of the influence of Roman law on modern state theories. 
First off, he says Roman private law is a very good system. He says it's a treasure trove of very reasonable principles which are valid at all times. And this is the experience that anyone who studied law had with Roman law. Roman law, in fact, is the, the, ba <clears throat> the basis of the modern civil codes. Most countries in, in continental Europe use civil codes, which are a direct derivation from, from Roman law. In some countries, Roman law is still applied after 2,000 years. And uh, you may remember the very favorable opinion of Bruno Leoni on Roman law. He said basically that Roman law, with its very slow development through the work of um, experts, of judges, and the slow accumulation of principles, is maybe a model of um, for libertarian law, of how law would be discovered in a free society. Bruno Leoni says uh, law cannot be posited, it's not the work of a sovereign, but it has to be discovered starting from some basic principles. And this is basically Roman private law, and Haller says uh, the, the same thing, uh, basically. What is very different is his evaluation of Roman public law, and this is what I find extremely interesting. He said um, Roman public law influenced very negatively uh, modern thought about the state, and uh, Roman public law may be the, the, the culprit, the, the responsible for the uh, very damaging theory of social contract. He gives a number of reasons why this happens. First of all, the fascination of classical culture. Classical culture is still important for any one of us. We read ancient authors. Uh, we, we are under the spell of, of uh, authors like, like Cicero, like the Greek philosophy, uh, like the Roman historians. Uh, Latin has been widely used, says Karl Ludwig von Haller. It was the lingua franca during the Middle Ages. In Europe you spoke Latin, and Latin was the language of, of academia, of the universities. Until a certain time, no one in his mind would ever think to write uh, something important in French or in Italian or in German, but it was just Latin. <clears throat> then he makes another very interesting remark. He says, uh, the problem is, uh, the adoption of Roman terminology, because if uh, legal theorists talked about the state, they couldn't but use the Latin terms used for public law. And here he says we have a problem, because the Roman terminology is mainly republican. It comes from a republican time, and um, it was adapted to the, to the Roman Empire. Uh, of course, it was part of, of, the, of the giant propaganda uh, operation of, of the early emperors, especially of, of Augustus, to um, tell the Roman people that the Republic was still there, whereas Haller says it was just a usurpation, it was just a military dictatorship. But still, uh, Roman uh, Roman authors continued to use uh, terms which are adapted to a republic and not to a monarchy, like, for example, societas civilis, so, societas civilis, I have the, 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 the Italian church uh, um, uh, pronunciation, so I would say societas civilis, civitates res publicas populus comitia, Patrimonium Populi, this is very important, patrimony of the people, uh, public monies, which is, he says, completely illogical with a monarchy. Uh, especially the idea that he says is that the, um, the Republican terminology passed over to modern states. And so, in a way, there was this, this idea, undercurrent, of course, that um, the states belong to the people. 
So this is basically what uh, Haller says about Roman law and its influence on, on modern state thinking. He says this idea that the, the states are somehow based on the on the public uh, on the power of the people on on, on the on a sort of transfer of sovereignty from the from the public public assemblies to the magistrates this is the cause why we had the theories of social contract and I may mention Thomas Hobbes John Locke Rousseau and so on and the modern idea that the states come out of a sort of a covenant between the people and the and the uh, structure of power. Um, I would like to expand a little bit of, on, on Rome. Uh, why does this idea come from Rome? I think it makes perfectly sense. Um, ancient Rome, both the, mm, the age of the kings and the early age of the, of the Republic, uh, may be described as a corporation of robbers. Uh, ancient Rome was based on the idea that might is right, on the idea of conquest, on the idea that the, the strongest has the right to kill the enemies, to deport them as slaves, to steal their private property. And this was basically the, the, the way to do it in, in, in ancient Europe. And uh, a city-state like Rome, I, I'd really like to, to compare it to a corporation of robbers. The early kings were elective, and uh, it is important to note that one of the most ancient traditions of, of Roman public law is the so-called Lex de Imperio. It is the law by which often fictitiously, but anyway, this, this survived until the age of the emperors, by which the assembly of the people transfers the absolute military power to the kings first and then to the magistrates. Uh, it is a very important passage of, of Roman law, of Roman public law, because even the elected officials, the consuls, the praetors, and so on, they couldn't really exercise their power, especially their military power, without the Lex de Imperio, which was formal but very important. Uh, Rome developed during the passage, I would say, a very important passage in ancient military history, because uh, uh, the world passed from a sort of a hero heroic warfare where there were some champions, some knights who were the, the most, the strongest in, in war and, and the ablest in war. And, and the history, the story of the, of the Horazi and the Curiazi is, is a good example of, of this kind of, of war making with some champions who fight against each other in, in, a, in a singular fight. Uh, to a system of large infantry armies. Uh, this happened first with Alexander the Great, we, who with the, his uh, opletes, with, the, with the, um, large infantry armies, conquered most of the, of the known world. And this had, um, uh, as a consequence, the first um, big struggle between the patricians and the plebeians. Since the nobility and the, the um, nobility of war wasn't able to do war anymore because they needed the people, uh, the plebeians uh, managed to, uh, to get some political clout during a number of revolutions, of secessions, and so on. And um, during the first period of the, of the Republic, <clears throat> a system developed where there was this corporation managed mainly by the nobility with certain rights of the, of the common people who were mainly um, armed peasants and who uh, a part of them were the, the upper class of the peasants or the, or those who could buy and maintain a horse, a war horse. The cavalry was very important during the first time and then the importance of the cavalry went down in comparison to the, to the infantry. But uh, it was an alliance between nobility and armed peasants with a large number of proletarians who didn't have any importance, not in war and not in, in, the, in the government. Of course, Rome expands 
it conquers enormous territories, first in Italy and then in the rest of Europe. And uh, the second big clash that develops between the, the social classes is the one between the, the, the soldiers and the, the armed peasants who participated in the very long and very, uh, very tiresome military campaigns of Rome and the nobility. The clash is about the, the, um, the land. The idea of the nobility was that they had the exclusive right to get the conquered lands and the, um, the plebeians, the soldiers, laid a claim on these lands and this is uh, the, the, the issue of, of the whole crisis of the Republic which I would start with the reforms of the, of the Gracchan uh, brothers, the Gracchi, who uh, tried to find a way to distribute the, the conquered lands to the soldiers. Now I have make a small incurse on Roman military law, which is very important to understand Roman public law. Uh, the central concept, which is the concept which still is the origin of our idea of, of sovereignty, of, of absolute power, is the concept of imperium. The imperium is the absolute power of the military commander. The Roman commanders, the victorious Roman commanders, are hailed emperors by, by their soldiers. But anyway, uh, there is a fundamental distinction in Roman public law between what happens in Rome and uh, to a certain distance from Rome, which is called domi, at, at, at home, and what happens in the army, militiae. There is this, this expression, domi militieque, home and military. And the powers of the magistrates and the duties of the subjects were completely different in, in the two sections. In, whereas in Rome, there were certain guarantees from absolute powers. For example, a very important law is the law about the provocatio ad populum. This is the right of appeal of the persons who have been condemned by the, by the highest magistrates, by the consuls, by the praetors, to appeal to the people. And um, this is a very important guarantee for the Roman citizens. But this works at home, in Rome. It doesn't work in the military, where the power of the military commander is absolute. It is structured on the idea of the power of the ancient pater familias, the head of the family, and it is a power of life and death. It is a disciplinary power, and Rome's uh, armies were very effective in realizing the principle that the soldiers must be way more afraid of their commanders than of the enemies. Uh, Roman military discipline was one of the strictest ever uh, ever uh, put in place. The, any soldier could be put to death for uh, the slightest disobedience and for the slightest misgiving in, in, in his military duties. And um, the, the central concept of Roman power is the concept of imperium, the, power, the concept of absolute power. It is the power of war. It is the power of conquest. One very interesting um, etymology is that of province. Province is provincia, and it means it has, it has been conquered. It comes from vincere, from, from winning the war. So it is the ter territory that has been militarily subdued. At a certain point, the equilibrium between the social classes crumbles over the the question of the, of the distribution of the lands. And uh, another very important passage in Roman history is the reform, the army reform of Marius. Marius, the opponent of Sulla, he was a very successful military commander and he was the, of the party of the so-called populars, the popularis, the, the democrats, like moms and says, they had nothing democratic, but anyway. And uh, on the other side there was the landed nobility. Marius has a, a 
stroke of genius, and he decides to uh, let the proletarians, the, the head count, the so-called capitacensi, get into the army. So the lowest uh, classes of the, of the people can make a career as soldiers. Making a career as soldiers means, of course, taking risks, uh, uh, traveling through whole Europe, but still having part of the, of the, of the booty and having part especially of, uh, of the, the promise that all uh, Roman generals at the end of the Republic make to their soldiers to have part in the distribution of the lands. Uh, the reform of Marius gives rise to the um, power of the military commanders. It is the origin of what later will become the absolute power of the, of the emperors. Uh, we, used, we are used to consider Caesar as the first emperor so-called emperor and Augustus the, the real first emperor of the Roman Empire. Uh, in reality the um, Roman politician who started the empire is Pompey and uh, there is a very important law in, in uh, Roman uh, public history which is the Lex Gabinia de Piratis Perseguendis. It is a law uh, which gave Pompey the absolute power on all the provinces, even on most part of the Italian territory, to uh, set up a very powerful navy to fight the pirates. He is very successful after um, winning against the pirates. Another law is passed to give him uh, the command in Asia against the King Mithridates, which is the Lex Manilia, and for a number of years Pompey is the absolute ruler of the Roman, and what we now call the Roman Empire. And um, this is the first instance of the uh, establishing of, uh, of, a, of a mixture between civil and military power. Pompey is both a civil ruler, he, he organizes the Asian provinces, he uh, destroys the cities and the strongholds of the pirates, and at the same time he is the absolute military commander. It is very interesting to note as, as on the side that whereas this happens, or shortly before this happens, there was a revolution going on, a revolution started by a former uh, military commander, Sertorius, who took hold of, of uh, Spain and who had some unseemingly allies in the, uh, the, the pirates themselves, the King Mithridates who exchanged ambassadors with, uh, with Sertorius from one side, from Turkey to, to Spain, and some Celtic tribes who tried to free themselves from the, from the Roman from the Roman power, and uh, it is an attempt to establish a different world, which is not based on the ruthless exploitation of the provinces, and maybe, I think maybe this is a very modern interpretation, but anyway to do something to defend freedom against the, the um, Roman Empire. Of course, Sertorius is uh, defeated, not militarily, but by a, by a, um, a traitor who, who gives him uh, venom. Uh, the Romans win. The Celtic tribes, first in Spain, are completely destroyed. And then afterwards, uh, the example of Pompey is the big example that Julius Caesar follows. It is interesting to note that the first military command of Julius Caesar was in Spain. So the first thing he did was to uh, pacify according to Roman standards, in, in reality to subdue completely uh, Spain, which was very important for, for uh, precious metals and, and for natural resources. Then he goes back, he is elected consul, and the year after he gets exactly as Pompey a special command in Gaul. And uh, he does the same thing as Pompey. Pompey didn't have the courage to 
go to Rome with his armies. He, at, at a certain point, this was too much of a, of a constitutional violation for him. But this is exactly what Julius Caesar does. And uh, after Caesar comes back, he takes hold of the state as the first emperor um, in, in many regards. Uh, but he still thinks that he can come to terms with the landed aristocracy. So he gives lots of pardons. Of course, he is enormously rich because in the meanwhile, he uh, robbed all the gold of Gaul, which was a very rich country. He killed, according to modern statistics, um, between one million and three million people there with swords. You must imagine what, what kind of massacre it has been. And he comes back enormously rich. He changes the world forever because uh, Gaul becomes a Roman province. And uh, he tries to come to terms with the landed uh, aristocracy. It does, it, he fails because uh, they kill him, as it is widely known. And his successor, Octavianus, and then later Augustus, uh, does come to terms on a completely different basis. He kills them all. This is what, what he does, basically, through the system of the proscriptions. Proscription means uh, sale of, of confiscated goods. In practice, this means uh, they, they are killed, except the, the few ones who uh, come to terms with the new regime. And um, what is very important to note from Augustus and Caesar, they change history, they change the past. They are very able propaganda men and they uh, manage to convince the, the, the posterity, even us, that uh, in a sort of way they established the peace, you know, the, the, the idea of the Pax Romana comes from that time, whereas in fact they are military commanders who manage to uh, establish their ruthless dominion on, on, uh, on the world. Uh, in a way, what happened uh, at the times of Julius Caesar and uh, Augustus is a great reset which succeeded. We must think of it. Um, the uh, Half of the world speaks Romanic languages. In France, you speak French, and in uh, Spain, which is the, the, uh, one of the heirs of the Roman Empire, spread Spanish through all the world. Uh, the ancient world was completely destroyed by, by the Romans. Of course, there are some good things, as I mentioned before, Roman uh, private law, but still, they managed to reset the world completely during these 50, 70 years, which transformed everything. So we have a state which is based on military might, on absolute power. And what is the solution of Karl Ludwig von Haller to come to him? And this is the conclusion of, of my speech. What uh, does he think is the foundation of states? He said, princes and republics do not and cannot exercise more power than they would have as individuals. So he bases the power of the states just on private property, on contracts, and basically on a voluntary uh, um, relationship where someone has the power, but it, it is no, no different, says Karl Ludwig von, ha von Haller, from the power that maybe an owner has, or maybe the power that someone who has superior knowledge has in in his relationships with the ones who want to learn from him. And what is very important is, uh, Karl Ludwig von Haller says, power is always limited by natural law, which means by the law of freedom and private property. And he said, there are three ways to defend yourselves uh, uh, in comparison to um, abuse of power and to the to the um, wrong use of power. The first is religion. So the rulers should adhere to certain religious principles. The second, which is very important in my opinion, is resistance, even violent resistance. So he said, if you can, and if states abuse of their power, you can resist and you can violent, violently resist against them. He says, even revenge may be a form of resistance. 
Third and last uh, resort is flight. But anyway, his states are states based basically on, on voluntary associations. A few years after uh, um, uh, Haller wrote his magnum opus, Gustave de Molinari wrote his very important article about the private production of security, and he says there should be uh, competition among governments. I think this goes in the direction of uh, Haller's ideas and the, in the direction of libertarian ideas. Thank you for your attention.